really delighted to have Frances here today. She will reintroduce herself, but she's nurse tutor um, on the Tullamore campus. And, and uh, Frances will be talking to us today about person-centeredness um, and palliative care. And then after that, we're going to have a wonderful uh, session on self-care and staff well-being with our own fabulous Mary Love Grove. Mary um, currently works for the Hospice Foundation. And then our um, healthcare manager, uh, Siobhan O'Brien-Green, is going to give an update um, uh, on behalf of my IHF, and then I will close off. So as you can imagine, uh, the, the time is going to go quickly. So welcome everybody that I haven't had a chance to welcome. I see a few names popping up. Delighted to see everybody. But for now, I'm going to hand over to Frances to share her screen. And we'll go through. The, oh, sorry, a couple of things. I'm sorry, Susan. I, I, you, were, you were burned in my brain there. We are going to record this session. And I hope that's okay with everybody. Um, and in, in addition to that, people will have a chance to ask questions. There's one of two ways of doing it. You can either be writing into the chat as we're going along or at the end of Francis's presentation, we'll give a few minutes if anybody literally wants to speak up um, at like, like I am now. So there's a couple of options there. Same with when, when Mary's doing hers or Siobhan, if you have any questions, okay? So um, without uh, much ado, I'm going to pass you over to Francis. Thank you so much, Francis. Thank you. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm just gonna sh share my screen, if I can. Yeah, here we are. Uh, from um, as I say, my name is Frances Neville. I um, am at the moment, uh, since April, I've been the, um, delighted to be the nurse lead for the clinical programme in the HSC for palliative care. But um, my main job is that I'm a nurse tutor based here in Tullamore um, on the hospital campus. And um, previous to that, I have worked extensively in palliative care, predominantly in a community team. So I'm hoping I can share a bit of what I've learned over the many years I've been um, working with clients with palliative care needs um, from both a community perspective and also from a hospital and nursing home um, perspective. Um, I think I could talk for about uh, maybe 20, 25 minutes, if that's all right. And we'll have questions. I might even talk faster or sometimes I just talk too much. So I'm trying to keep an eye on the time. So Georgina, give me the five minute warning if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, so I suppose in the, um, where we are at the minute, um, my screen, it, it's not showing what I wanted to say, is thinking about in the, where we are, on, where we are now, um, COVID-19, I suppose, has um, put uh, nurses and all healthcare professionals in a different place and a different way of working. Um, and sometimes it's, it has been difficult, I would say, um, in practice to maintain that person-centered approach. But again, it's what nurses you would do well, and especially within palliative care, we have to keep that going. Um, so as I say, COVID-19 has put it, it's unexpected. Uh, we didn't know what was you know, coming for, um, to our doors, as it were, for both for people who are ill and um, workers and the healthcare professionals like us all. But I suppose the main thing is we have to ensure that the care that we provide is of the best end of life care, palliative care, um, in your areas of work. Um, and it's really important to support your residents and our residents um, for people that are unwell in general time, but also during this difficult time. So this is just a little bit of what we're used to looking at now, and we've probably become a little bit, um, uh, you know, accustomed to it. Um, you know, 1,700, I think this was yesterday's figures, 1,736 people have died since the beginning of um, April, end of March, which is a lot, a great deal. Um, and we mustn't, um, you know, I think looking at the figures, it's very stark. It reminds us, um, you know, what we're doing every day. Um, and it's so important, those families that have, um, you know, endured what they have gone through. So, you know, we might be getting used to it, but just not to forget what's behind those, those numbers. So stealing something from the Irish Hospice Foundation, um, I just think we do need to be reminded um, sometimes that what we're doing, um, we're caring for sick and the dying. And Bono, that great man said, it's, um, look, it's a big mark of our own humanity. Um, and, you know, we have to fight for the things that lots of people fight for, for equality, 
while, while they're alive, but we also have to ensure that the best care is provided to people that are dying um, in the phase, you know, and coming up to dying, and also for um, what happens afterwards for families. Um, in the words of Valerie Billingham, I'm sure you're all very familiar with this, nothing about me without me. So that's the whole concept of, we wrapped it up in, the, in that, um, in person-centred care. Um, and then just to think about that in everything um, that we do. And as I say, this has probably been very challenged in the last um, uh, little while. So what is um, person-centred care? Well, it's um, the principles really are based on treating people as individuals. And I know that um, flows off the tip of my tongue very easily, but thinking about that, what we're doing, respecting the person, respecting their rights, then, you know, we talk about personhood, knowing the person. Um, and then to do that, you need to have built a really good relationship. And uh, we both have to trust each other and understand where we're coming from. Um, and that all helps developing um, your uh, therapeutic relationships as you do um, throughout your, your um, interactions with your patients. Um, it is more than patient, we sometimes hear about patient-centered care, but we have to be careful that sometimes um, you can see that from, it relates to systems and processes um, and how, that, how you fit the patient in there. Um, but person-centered care is really looking at what the person believes in, what their values are, and then thinking about our values as well, um, knowing the person, valuing the person. And then from the, um, I think from the nurse's pers perspective, looking at our moral integrity and how we can move on, how we reflect, how we work, um, and can we go back and look and see how we make things better. It promotes collaboration um, because as we know, um, nurses don't work on their own, we're involved in a bigger team. Um, but look at how we collaborate, how we work with um, both professionals and also service users. And also to think about um, working with a person rather than doing to them. And that again, I think probably has been challenged um, in the last few months when we think about um, COVID and, and how that's made us work. And I'm, I'm sure some people have been challenged um, by you know, the differences, how they, you know, they've had to adapt and um, how they've worked. Um, there's a lot of work done by the Health Foundation and they've um, done a huge amount of research um, and they've proved, they've proved that with using um, person-centered care, you can improve um, the patient experience, um, but also looking at quality and health outcomes. And again, um, we have to be very focused on that as well, that well, care we're providing is um, of the best quality based on the best evidence um, and for the person receiving it um, they're getting um, the best care as well. So it talks about and um, they talk about the uh, four principles um, and you're all very aware of this and um, that the person is always treated with dignity, compassion and respect. Again very easy, fall off the tongue very easy but again to look at those words what does dignified care mean? How do we show compassion? What do we do um, in nursing that's really important to show compassion, to bring that into our care every day? And obviously respecting um, the person, the individual, and, their, and we're thinking about their family as well. Um, that our care is personalized. And then that there's coordination going on as well, that there's no point in having this really you know, great example of personalized care, nobody knows about it, that that's shared. Um, and I think about advocacy as well, and, and nurses are really good at advocating for the person. And we talk about enabling care as well, and that maybe we need to think about um, things like you know, the audit, um, is it the best possible care? How do we know? we ask the patient um, looking at patient outcomes um, and that's something about how we improve our services. Um, because and and I don't know if uh, everybody is nur a nurse on the, um, probably not, but um, I would go back, how do I know what I'm doing is the best? As a nurse I'm guided by my code of conduct. It's based on five principles and there it is, um, the first one in our code of conduct is respect for the dignity of the person. We're also responsible and accountable for what we do as nurses. We are um, committed to providing 
um, quality practice and how do we show that we use the best evidence there is and we know that um, person-centered care provides better outcomes and much better um, you know the, per the person themselves feels listened to and they can um, collaborate better with their um, living with their illness as it were trust and confidentiality I think here things like consent, um, we need to be very aware of that and what we do um, on a daily basis as nurses. And as we've alluded to, um, we have to collaborate and work with others. And sometimes we have to, as nurses, really promote uh, the principle of, of person-centeredness. Okay, and again, that's just a little um, picture. Um, just to remind us again, um, as nurses, what we're doing, what's different, um, and what our values, what's um, holding us up, um, as you know, what's making us do the job that we do. And all the time there, we're, talking, we're looking at patient safety. And again, that comes into person centeredness as well, that everything is for the best um, outcome for, for the person. Um, I just found it, I don't know why, um, just thinking about palliative care, what, um, what do you need to be a palliative care nurse or um, working um, within, um, you know, settings that you do need to um, apply the principles of, of palliative of nursing. Um, and as I say, this can be for everybody that will be providing palliative care. It's not um, the job of specialists. The job of everybody so every nurse healthcare assistant doctor physio ot and um, but for nursing we need to know what the principles of palliative care are we need to be looking at our communication skills and again that has been um compromised and improved i would say over the past few months looking at comfort how we maintain comfort how we give the best quality of life um, to people that are living the final days weeks months of their life um, care planning and working collaboratively, really important. And we think about, um, and I'm not going to talk about it today, but advanced care directives, how much collaboration is required with other members of the team. And then we always think about afterwards um, as well for the families, their, how they're gonna cope um, and the impact of grief and bereavement. Um, and then underpinning everything that we do is, um, that we're working within our um, our profession, as I said, we just looked at the code of practice for nursing, but that we're doing everything that's ethical, that's best for the patient. Um, that's uh, of reference there. There's a huge document, um, and all areas, every speciality is covered. So we wanted to have a little look. It's there. So looking at palliative care, and there's um, the big definition that you will see is the World Health. Um, World Health Authority from 2002, and this is what you will see um, most of the time. It's that we say it's an approach, so it's not just one thing. We're looking at it improves the quality of life of patients and their families facing the problem um, associated with life-threatening illness. It doesn't say cancer. It doesn't say COPD. So it's many illnesses um, of how you're going to do that is by the prevention and relief of suffering by means of early identification and impeccable, ass um, impeccable assessment and treatment of pain and other problems and that includes both the physical the psychological the psychosocial and the spiritual so it's not just one thing it's um, looking at the person as a whole um, a big busy slide again part of the world health um, organization their definition i quite like this definition it was um, from a long time ago now 2001 palliative care is essentially about people ordinary people who find themselves facing extraordinarily difficult situations the loss of independence the loss of financial security the loss of all that is safe and familiar the loss of friends and family the loss of future and ultimately the loss of life um, that to me says a lot, no matter where you work, um, you can identify um, with that um, definition. Now, I just want to um, talk to you about uh, where palliative care, I always go back to the history a little bit, and um, Dame Cecily Saunders is attributed with the developing the first, um, I suppose, hospice in modern hospice, we would say, um, in England. Um, and she was really, um, just look, I just really admire everything that she's she's done. And um, way back in the 1960s, now she challenged this um, 
what was happening really in the, in the NHS in England, um, she felt that there was no, you know, dying was hidden. And um, so she tried to open that up. She identified that the social death was occurring prior to physical death. Um, so, you know, the person was, you know, they weren't really being listened to. So the very opposite of person-centered care. And she really wanted to um, make the dying part of somebody's life as important as what has gone on before. And then looking at how to relieve suffering and from an emotional perspective as well. And she felt that you could learn a lot in that final phase of your life. And uh, one of her big, big things was she talked about to be with dying patients, to spend time. Sometimes it's difficult. Um, and, you know, I learned a lot from, from when I worked in St. Christopher's, just to sit with somebody and to say nothing. And for me, that was quite difficult at the start. But, um, you, know, you, you know, it's hugely important. That act of listening, trying not to say something. And the awareness surrounding death and dying, nobody is hiding. Um, it's very open conversation. Um, but we have to be honest, it's painful. Um, it can be reminding us of, of people that are working, um, to seeing people going through this difficult phase of, of maybe living and dying. And it makes us think about our own mortality. And it does cost us. So that emotional labour part is really important to um, acknowledge. And I'm delighted that Mary follows on from when um, I talk about this. So how we're going to take care of ourselves. Again, um, I think it's when we're talking about person-centered care, I like to share this as well. I'm sure you've all um, seen it before. Dame Cecily Saunders said, you matter because you are you um, and you matter to the last moment of your life. We will do all we can to help you, not only to die peacefully, but to live until you die. So, you know, there's a lot of living in, in the process. Um, you might have heard of things like the um, principles of palliative care, and we said it is an approach, um, it's, it's guided by the sets of principles that address the specific needs of the person and their family. Sorry, so, Francis, just to yes. say, I'm so sorry, about five more minutes, just in case anybody wants to ask a question or comment okay, that needs us yeah. an extra few minutes. So, uh, in and around the five minutes, Francis. Yeah, okay, no, thanks. I think I, um, that's great. Thank you, Georgina. Okay. So what we want to do in palliative care is promoting quality of life and good symptom control. But it's not enough um, to control physical symptoms. We have to think about the holistic approach. What is important for that in that person's life and how their illness is affecting that. Um, bringing in the people that matter to them might not be their family. It could be somebody else, you know, thinking about that and being able to engage in that open and honest um, communication. Um, going. So I'm not going to go through that, but as a, well, all I want you to remember is everybody can provide palliative care. If we talk about different levels, level three being specialists in that hospice, but any nurse um, health care system that is working anywhere, you can provide your level of, of palliative care. Um, sorry, going backwards. Um, recent challenges. I'm thinking of COVID. We've talked about this warlike language. We've got used to saying things like the war against COVID, front line. How does social distancing sound? It makes us, again, thinking about the communication and the difficulties. Physical distancing is a much gentler way of saying things. A person with COVID, rather than saying the COVID patient. You've all heard the no visitors. And again, that's um, been quite challenging. But it, you have allowed visiting, but it's probably been suspended. But you are, um, everybody has tried to, in exceptional circumstances, and I don't know, um, people at end of it, um, you know, you have provided compassionate end of life care. The whole PPE dressed up and all that, is there a way to personalize it? And I've seen um, from some teams that put their names on the front of their gowns or put photos, just trying to um, make it easier for the person. So what can we do in the future? So um, going back to what we started off with, nursing is always going to be provided with dignity, compassion and respect. Get, being involved in that shared decision making, us nurses not telling the person, but involving them with um, decision making. Thinking about our verbal and nonverbal communication, 
skills, um, and especially when you're wearing um, PPE, body language and tone of voice is so important because you can't be seen, your mouth is not visible, really important. And looking at the environment and how to enhance um, end of life care, coordinating of what we're doing, avoiding people, as we say, another term, working in silos and bringing the whole lot together. And then looking at how you can in, um, make care enabling, that's looking at patient reported outcomes, um, looking at what patients are thinking, looking at tools that you've used, things like pain assessment tools, spiritual assessment tools, tools um, just to show what we're doing and to demonstrate and to show that you are providing a good, um, good level of care to your patients. And then finally, and I know the girls have got Mary on, the whole self-care to stay working with patients with palliative needs and you need to look after yourself to be able to provide that compassion and, and respect. And I think I'll finish now. This is my last slide. Um, just again, thinking about the, the Cecily Saunders, we can't take away the whole hard thing that is happening, but we can help to bring the burden into manageable proportions. So again, just to be, to finish um, with you know, her, Dame Cecily's words of wisdom, just breaking it down, doing what we can do and keeping the person at the centre. Thank you. I'm sorry I've spoken very fast. Yeah, Francis, not at all. That was absolutely wonderful. Thank you very much. I mean, now we have the opportunity for the next seven, five, seven, however many minutes, if anybody wants to make any, any comments or, or ask, uh, ask any questions. I guess what was resonating for me, Francis, as you were talking, and I know you've been to some of our um, networking events. Um, oh I'll just stop sharing the screen. Okay, there you go. Um, thank you very much, Francis. Yeah, sorry, you've been to one of our networking events. And then um, just it, it, one of the last slides resonated with me hugely for all of the, the res, uh, residential care facilities that we link in with, they are all doing levels of palliative care and doing it to really, really, really high standards. And it yes. comes out in everything they do and all of the conversations and meetings and networks and trainings that we do with them. Um, and that's always one of the strong points about having a special palliative care input at, at, at events like this, because that comes out all the time, you're already doing it. So, and, and having the confidence in that, I, I think is, is, uh, is what it's all about. Yeah, Joanne, do you need me? Yeah, go ahead, Joanne. Hello. Yeah, it was just a comment, really. And there was a lovely moment on the RTE documentary last night where it was where they found the patient in ICU had tested positive, so they had to clear out the ICU. And there was a patient who was very frightened. A person was very frightened. And the doctor explained why they were wearing all the PPE. And it's just don't underestimate the simple explanations that you can provide, which can fill in massive gaps for people, um, especially when we've got this, you know, this alien looking PPE mask and, and all that they get up on. Um, and it just it really struck me last night, like the power of the simple explanation and the giving the information very basically. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Joanne. And often it is a very simple, but we, um, because we've also got so used to talking about the PPE and wearing the PPE that um, for the person seeing a nurse or a doctor wearing this equipment for the first time is very frightening. So just being able to explain why um, and introducing yourself and the whole communication piece not just it, the whole non-verbal is hugely important and how you speak and how you sound with the mask, it can be, you know, very difficult just, just to try and improve things if you can. And another thing that jumped out, Francis, was when you were just saying it's the simple things like person centeredness can sometimes I feel anyway, sound a little overwhelming in ways because it's a, you're trying to catch yourself in every way of treating people with dignity and compassion so on so on but actually it's it's all the wonderful simple things that staff do every hour of every day that is the person centeredness and that makes that real difference to the quality of, of their life and death experience yeah 
Yeah. And it's finding out about um, your residents, like what do you need to know from that one person? What do they need to tell you? Developing the relationship and knowing about their whole life, not just about that um, small piece at the end. You know, it's, celebrate, it's a celebration as well. And, um, you know, what's important to you? What do we need to know about you? What can, you know, what makes you feel good? And, you know, looking forward to things, it's really important as well. Absolutely. All those care plans and daily conversations yeah. that go to build up that body of knowledge that make the experience richer. Anybody else? Any comments or any questions or anything for Francis before we move on? No, Francis, thank you so well, much. I'll here. mute myself. Yes. Um, thank you so much again, Francis. That was absolutely fabulous. Um, without much ado, I'm going to hand over to our wonderful colleague, Mary who's going to do a session with us on self-care and staff well-being. And thank you so much, Mary, for being here today. Delighted to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity and for inviting me along, Georgina. You know, I always love to come and meet the Kill Network. Um, it's a, a, an area close to my heart. Um, I really love all the work that you're doing. So um, when I was asked to do this, I, um, there's so many areas you can cover when we talk about well-being. And then I thought, well, I only have half an hour. It's really not that much time. And instead of overloading you with stuff, because I think you're probably all quite overloaded already. I'm sure it's been an immense few months for you, probably nothing like it in your lifetime um, or in your careers. So just really bearing that in mind and maybe just taking this at a slower pace. But what I was thinking was, Starting with just a little bit of theory around a tool that I use a lot. It's, it's the Emotional Regulation System. It's by Paul Gilbert, just talking to you a little bit about that. And then doing an exercise or two. So you can actually have an opportunity for yourself to connect in with yourself. Um, Frances, I liked that you mentioned Dame Cicely Saunders. I'm a big fan of hers. Um, I loved her book. And one of the things that she always asks in palliative care is how are you within yourself? And that's really what this is all about. It's how are we within ourselves in this particular moment in time and being able to connect with ourselves. Because I think if most of us here are nurses, we're probably really good at being busy. And um, that can often be our default mode, particularly in this crazy world that we live in nowadays. And sometimes we can be really connect disconnected from that being human as opposed to being a human doing. Um, so what I might do is, if I can, I think I have permission. Am I sharing the screen now? Yeah, yeah sharing. Uh, if you just put it on presentation mode. Okay. Down. Can you see? Um, so if I just start, can you see that slide there? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Lovely. Okay. Now, so, so Paul Gilbert is. Um, he's a psychologist, and he has a. Um, sorry, I'm just make these tiles smaller. Yeah. Paul Gilbert is a clinical psychologist and he does com um, compassion focused therapy. And he came up with this really, really useful emotion regulation system. So he says that there's three, generally three types of emotional states that we're in. And I hope actually, does everyone have a pen and paper in front of them? Because you're going to be drawing circles in a second. But there's, there's three, generally three, three states. So there's threat, drive, or soothing. So if we start with the most dominant trait or the most dominant emotional state, it's threat. So this is when we evolved as a human species uh, thousands and thousands of years ago, in order for us to be able to survive, we need to have this fight, fly, fight, flight or freeze mechanism in our brain. So that's the emergency button in our brain, the amygdala, that we're probably all familiar with. When we, if you were to see a small child running out in front of a road, you would quickly react without necessarily being conscious of it and jump in front of that child to pull them back. Um, so it's a very, very important function in terms of us actually staying alive. Um, so it's about our protection, about our safety and about our survival. And when, this, when we're in this particular state, the hormones that are released are the stress hormones. So there's adrenaline and cortisol. And we probably know these feelings when we're feeling a bit stressed. I actually am feeling a little bit nervous now because I'm giving a presentation. So I could definitely feel that my heart rate is up a little bit. I'm probably a little bit more, um, I'm, I'm hotter in the body, that kind of thing. So it's like 
using the breath then to calm down your system. But so the, there are obviously you just talked about the pros in terms of it actually keeps us alive. If we didn't have this function within us, we would be um, we would be in danger of being uh, of being killed quite suddenly. So, but when we are in this state for um, long periods of time, we end up becoming more anxious. We're very worried. We're very stressed, and we're very fearful. So, what has happened is. As our brains have evolved, we are we haven't yet we have to learn ways to actually calm down this part of our brain um, and drop into different other regulation systems, which I'll talk about now in a second. So the next one that we will talk about is the drive system. So this is with regard to um, being motivated. Um, that you know, in terms of us wanting to achieve a qualification, or we want to get our house done up, or um, they're more kind of normal stuff or even like being able to be motivated to get up out of bed in the morning to go and get a job and get money um, so it's very much around striving achieving and, and consuming and the hormone that would be released when we're in this state is dopamine that feel-good hormone and often we get that sometimes even we know it when we might be on social media and we get a good response in terms of something we posted you get that little kind of mini fix but when we're in this state, if this, we're in, in this state for, you know, if there's an imbalance in this state, it can lead to perfectionism, burnout, depression, and addiction. Um, but the pros of it are that, again, it's one of the basic survival modes that we need in terms of being motivated to actually go and get food or feed our family, um, a motivator to go and get, get a job. And the other more kind of the nicer emotions around it would be excitement anticipation and joy. And then the third emotional state or emotional system is called the soothing system. And this is where we are within ourselves, back to Dame Cicely Saunders' question of how are you within yourself? And when we can access this part of us, we are more content, we feel more secure, and this then activates our more caring and kind nature. And we're generally more calm, there's more of a warmth around us, maybe we're feeling more at ease within ourselves or more at peace. And when I was looking at this again today, I was thinking about patients I've looked after at end of life. And when they come to that place where they're more at one with everything that's gone on in their life and they're ready to let go and ready to actually come to the end of their life. These are the kind of traits that I've noticed. That sort of sense of being at peace and being at ease. And the hormones that are released when we're feeling in this sort of soothing, when we're in this soothing system, our oxytocin, so that's often called the cuddle hormone that can be released just by pure physical contact with people. And actually, I'm sure a lot of people now have suffered from lack of contact um, and that isolation and even the, the, you know, the PPE that staff nurses now or you know, nursing home staff might be wearing in terms of that barrier between residents and, and the, the staff who are looking after them. And the other hormone then is also opiates. So the pros um, are this state allows us to heal, to recover and to recuperate. And again, I was thinking about that today in terms of what everyone's been through over the last couple of months. Um, this is where our parasympathetic nervous system is activated and which is very calming. There's feelings of nourishment. And also I've noticed for myself is um, that this is often where your best ideas come from when you're in this more soothing kind of state. But the con then, of course, is we can't be in the state forever, unfortunately, as lovely as it is, because we just wouldn't be motivated to do anything. Or, you know, it's very important for us to be able to, to react to situations. But just to kind of put them here together now, side by side. So we have the threat, the drive, and the soothing. So threat is generally we want to avoid something or we have an aversion to something. And the drive is we have a craving or a grasping. And that's generally what happens when something happens in our life. Either we have a tendency to either push it away or want more of it. So it's how can we actually learn to sort of be more at ease with what's happening. And it's been able for us to drop into learning to figure out ways. We can talk about this now in a second and we'll do an exercise. Is how do we access that soothing system to drop down? away from the necessary kind of threat. And I'm just always anxious, I'm worried, I feel like things are always going to go wrong. How can I actually access this, this soothing system where I'm more at ease within myself? 
particularly when you think about entering into a patient's room or a person might be nearing the end of their life or whatever. And how can I be a calming presence? Because I think our superpower that we all have is our presence. It's not necessarily what we say or what we do. It's that sense of our human, our being, our beingness. So as staff working in, um, in nursing homes, working with people nearing the end of their lives, working with people who are very vulnerable, what type of energy can we bring when we enter into that space with somebody and in terms of making that connection? So there's a difference here around, you know, at the top two is more that sense of doing and the bottom one is that sense of being. So just maybe for a second, and this is keeping this for yourself, but if you were to draw those circles and where, are you, where have you been living for the last number of months? Are you, if you were to reflect on what it's been like for you, um, either as a healthcare professional, but also as, you know, as a daughter, a wife, um, a partner, whoever, what, what, where have you been with, with regard to what's going on in your life? And maybe, I don't know, because a lot of people have their cameras off, but it'd be interesting to know, for maybe those who have their cameras on, like show of hands, which, who, who would notice that their threat circle might be the biggest out of the three? Okay, how about, how about soothing? Okay, drive. So, a couple of people are in drive, more in drive mode. I haven't seen, is anyone more in threat mode in recent times? It's not really, and soothing? Is it hard to tell? Okay. I'm going between all three Marys where I'm at on a daily basis. That's how I feel. Literally, I'm in, I'm in a mode of watching everything. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. That's, I, I can't answer any one because I'm constantly okay. trying to work around. Well, I think that's actually, that's kind of where you want to be. It's a bit of a dance. Um, you have, you're moving, it's been able to move between, between each of the states. So you're, you're not, you know, it just wouldn't make sense if you're only in, in one state. But what a lot of people generally notice is they're either in threat or drive most of the time and they don't have, because we're so busy and there's so much going on, we don't have much opportunity to actually, to draw a breath and drop into that soothing system, one where we can just restore, replenish, recuperate. And this doesn't necessarily mean that we have to be going off on a, on a retreat for a month, you know, in, in this sort of a, blissful state it's more finding moments in our day where we can actually just connect with ourselves and just and, and just take a breath and sometimes we talk about you know the, the um, moments like when we're washing our hands for example we seem to be washing our hands a lot more nowadays and that can be your moment where you can actually literally just be present to washing your hands and take a moment away from our busy minds um now let me come back into the slides um, so some ways then to activate the soothing system so a breathing exercise and we'll do an exercise in a few minutes um, when we what, the sheer act of breathing we're bringing in more oxygen into our system and that then is deact slow in deactivating the amygdala in our brain and releasing carbon dioxide so it's actually there's a, there's a biochemical chemical reaction simply by bringing more oxygen into our system and often what we find is when we're anxious or nervous or afraid, we hold our breath. So the simple act of, of breathing and learning to breathe properly has a very, very nice calming effect on our, on our body and reducing our stress. Another practice is meditation. Um, and that can be very, very difficult for some people. I know myself when I started to meditate, I actually had a physical reaction to it. I just, the idea of having to stop and when I was used to being, I've been conditioned to be so busy, 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 fixing, doing, and that idea of actually just stopping and dropping into that sense of um, that more soothing emotional system is where then I then I then I, I just learned to have a different kind of relationship with myself with regard to that need to be doing all the time, um, because it's just not very healthy. A lot of people, and we did our own little mini survey there a couple of months ago in the Irish Hospice Foundation, people just talk about the power of nature, just being out in, going for a walk, going in amongst trees into a forest, out to the park, or bringing your dog out for a walk, whatever it might be. It's just, it's, I mean, it just happens naturally when you're, when you're connected to nature. Um, some people love art, 
or, or various forms of arts, you know, you get into your flow and it gives you a break from all the various different things that are going on. Music is another way, finding the right kind of music can be very soothing. Um, and gratitude, one of the biggest things that I have found in my experience is taking note of all the things that I'm grateful for in my life. Um, and just the various different moments in my day. And for a while I was keeping it, you know, I just make a note of um, um, thing, two or three things at the end of the day um, in a notebook. I had to, um, you know, kind of keep a notebook on my bedside. And um, I, I, I actually, I stopped doing it for a while simply by the fact that I didn't have a pen. Quite, it was amazing actually, but I noticed the difference. Um, by simply recording two things every single day of something I was grateful for. And it just changed my brain, changed my defaults into terms of noticing the good. Because what happens is with, uh, with neuroplasticity, what is wired together, what is fired together, wires together. In our brain, we have thousands and thousands of neurons. And we have developed these various different pathways. So if we are prone to being anxious, the more anxious we are, the more anxious we're likely, likely to be. So there's various practices where you can actually rewire those pathways into, yeah, and this has actually been proven um, through functional MRIs, where you can actually see different parts of the brain have been, have developed in reaction to by just refocusing your attention onto other aspects of your life or other, other ways of being can actually benefit us physiologically. So it's, it's really powerful stuff. Um, so what I might like to do now, if it's okay with, with this group, is um, to do a short practice with you, um, maybe for a couple of minutes, and then I'm going to ask you to do your own, to do an exercise um, um, with regard to mapping out your typical day. So let me just see if I can see everybody again. Okay. So my colleagues in the Irish Hospice Foundation are very familiar with this. Um, but let's just give ourselves a couple of moments. And again, you know, this is very invitational. Um, you can opt in or opt out of this, but it's just a short exercise. It's like a form of meditation, but we're focused maybe on the breathing and see how we are and see if we can just check in with ourselves. And as Cicely Saunders says, how are we within ourselves within this particular moment? So it's checking on the time now. It's coming up to quarter past three, so I think we're doing okay for time. So if you want to maybe find a comfortable position for yourself in the chair, Feel free to have a stretch as well, if you feel like it. Um, just to know where you're still sharing your screen as well, if you want okay. to take it off. Thanks. No worries. Yeah. There you go. Thanks, Susan. So, maybe feeling your feet, the connection of your feet against the floor. And taking in the support of the chair. So we're literally going to give ourselves a few moments to just simply stop. And take a breather. So no doubt our minds are very busy, particularly if this is a working day for you. I'm sure you have so much that you need to be doing right now. So the invitation to start is maybe, can you, self, can you give yourself permission to be here right now? It's almost like you've got that to-do list. It's like you're just placing it down for a few minutes. And you're giving yourself permission, that sense of nothing to do right now and nowhere to be right now. And when we stop like this, sometimes we can notice how busy our minds are. Maybe lots of thoughts coming and going. There may be something particularly worrying that's going on in our lives at the moment. So there's no need to change anything or feel that our mind should be a particular way. But one way to give ourselves a bit of a break is to connect with the body. 
So feeling the connection with the feet against the floor. Body against the chair. And then taking a moment to sense the, the breath coming into and out of the body. Sometimes we think that we should be breathing a particular way. But with a practice like this, there's no need to change or fix anything. You're simply just noticing the breath coming and going in its own natural way. That sense of allowing the body to breathe for you. Maybe noticing the parts of the body that are moving in response to each breath. Maybe the rise in the chest area. A feeling of fullness in the belly. Maybe sensing the rib cage and the lungs moving and what might it be like to allow yourself to take some deeper and fuller breaths maybe three three deep breaths in your own time and your own way right now done that, allowing your breathing to resume its own natural rhythm. Sometimes when we do this, it can be a little bit challenging for us. We might find a feeling of kind of like tightness in our chest, or it's just a bit overwhelming when we turn our attention to our breath. So at any point, you have, your, you have the, the option to divert your attention elsewhere. So it could be simply feeling the connection of the body against the chair. Or taking any, any signs that you're noticing within the room or the building around you. And making some wise choices with regard to what suits you in any given moment. So have you had a chance yet today? It's 20 past three, the 1st of July. Have you had a chance yet today to, to even say hello to yourself? To connect in. Almost that sense of coming home to yourself. regardless of how you might be right now. So allowing everything to be as it is. Cultivating a friendly attitude towards yourself. Yeah, maybe you 
opening of the awareness as we draw this short practice to a close to feel the body sitting here against the chair maybe the feet against the floor feeling free to have a stretch or a yawn lovely to see a couple of yawns there on the on the video screens fantastic So that's just a very short practice. Um, and what I, what I, with regard to, I mean, I do mindfulness meditation, but it's very simple. If you're, in, very in, if you're interested in doing something like that, all you need to do is maybe Google two minute mindfulness practice on YouTube and start there and find one that you like and see what it's like to do that every day for a week or something and if, see if you notice any difference. But what I'd like to do now, um, we, we have, still have a little bit of time left is, um, where is my, here we go, share back, the, sharing the presentation again. So um, one thing I want to show you quickly before we do the exercise that I find really helpful, and I can, I can only imagine um, how busy your lives are at the moment. But one thing when I sometimes feel overwhelmed with various different things that I need to do or not do, is I think of a fried egg. And in, in, in the yolk of the egg is everything that's within my, with, but that's within my control, things that I can actually do something about. And then everything else that might be, things that might be bothering me that are outside my control, I put into the white of the egg. And it just helps me to create some boundaries for myself with regard to what I'm able to do and what I'm able to take on. And that really helps me to mind myself. So I just wanted to share that with you. Now I'd like to invite you to, um, if you have a piece of paper in front of you, maybe an A4 piece of paper, and on that piece of paper, if you were to draw a little grid for yourself with these various different columns. So this is where we'll take a couple of minutes. We have maybe, we'll do four or five minutes to map out a typical day for yourself. Um, from the moment that you wake up, so you wake up, what's the first thing you might do? Could be check your phone or could be, you know, go and have a shower, have your breakfast, get dressed to map out a typical day. And then once you've done that, to just using those three columns here, nourishing, depleting, or satisfying. And when you look at those various different tasks, for you, do you notice if they're nourishing, depleting, or satisfying? And sometimes you might be ticking all three. So nourishing is where you, you have a feeling of well-being around. It could be, you know, in terms of your first coffee of the morning, for example, or saying hello to your colleagues at work or having a shower. If it's depleting, um, you know, filling in reports, for example, um, doing your grocery shop, whatever it might be. And then satisfying, this is that feeling of kind of mastery, you know, those jobs that we all have that we kind of dread, like cleaning out the fridge. So it's not nourishing, it's not depleting, but I have a good feeling afterwards. And every time I see that clean fridge, I'm like, yeah, I'm really glad that I got to do that or sorting out the nurse's station, whatever it might be. So maybe just taking a couple of moments, and if we don't have enough time to finish it today, I think it's useful just to see what the balance is like with regard to all the different things that you're doing every day and whether or not they are nourishing, depleting for you. So I'll leave you, I'll maybe put myself on mute and just give you a few minutes to just take that time for yourself and see how you get on.
And maybe as you reflect on this and thinking about your interactions with people throughout your day, are there any golden moments there that you can maybe seize and make them more nourishing? So whilst life is so busy and there's an awful lot going on, we mightn't have time to, to really do anything too radical with regard to making changes around our well-being. But there could be stuff that you could reclaim. It could be simply that time when you're walking, walking between wards, for example. That's your moment to just drop into yourself when you're washing your hands or when you first make eye contact with your residents or when you look into your children's eyes. So I'm conscious now we're just approaching half three, so I really probably need to finish up at this point, Georgina. Um, but that's something that maybe you might want to, you know, just, it's quite a private thing to do. Um, but it can be quite nice to just maybe, it could be something that's coming up for you that you'd like to focus more on or give, give a bit more space to, to help you just f feel well within your normal day-to-day -day life. Can you, can you unshare your screen now at this stage, Mary? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much. Th thank you so much, Mary. That was absolutely gorgeous. Um, for my part, I always yawn when, when um, I, I must be in my way releasing, relieving stress or something. I don't know. And um, the other nice thing that happens to me, Mary, with those practices that we do with you is there's always a little tear down my eye. And I like that. I've heard somewhere that there's healing properties in tears. So I hold on to that. So uh, does anybody have any questions or comments for Mary? These are a quiet bunch, but that's okay. <laughs> Fortunately, I'm here to fill the gaps. Does that, did, did I interrupt anybody there? I was just saying thanks, Mary, because it really, I do appreciate these sometimes to be able to stop and even just be the mind settle for a little bit. And I certainly miss these when you're not around in these in the future. And uh, thank you very much for all of them. I found them very helpful. Pleasure. And I mean, I'm conscious that I haven't, you know, I don't, you know, we have a number of people here from nursing homes and it's, residential sector I, you know it's it's hard to know exactly how, how how you all are and what what you're experiencing at the moment um but more it's just more maybe the suggestion really is to i think we're all very good at looking after other people and not so much ourselves and actually in order for us to be able to look after ourselves look after others we need to be able to look after ourselves it's, it's like that analogy of you put your oxygen mask on first um so it's maybe, you know, giving yourself permission to create that space for yourself. But thank you very much for, um, for the invitation. It's been lovely to be here as always. And Mairead, did you want to say something? Did I see you unmuting or no? No, don't worry if you don't. Yeah, I was just going to say uh, I really enjoyed that. But also I loved the uh, picture of the fried egg because that's something, you know, it's a visual that we could all sometimes just stop and think um, what is inside our control and what is outside our control and sometimes we just need that visual to help us um, just to have deeper thoughts about that so thanks very much Mary for that. And um, one of the last comments I wanted to make was again it really resonates with what you were saying Francis around I mean the you know it's it's the simple things that really do help us and sometimes we disregard those it is the deep breath it is the walk in the garden for five minutes or, you know, or, or as you say, Mary, wash your hands or, you know, walking down the corridor or whatever any of, us, any of us can identify as a space in which we can soothe ourselves a little bit. Um, and I know um, we're all so busy, it might seem easier said than done, but actually that's a very powerful message that we've received today. It is about identifying those moments and, and owning them and giving ourselves permission to be present in them. So... Thank you so much, Mary. You are the starriest of stars. Twinkle, twinkle. <laughs> um, and Siobhan, top that. 
Um, our healthcare manager, uh, Siobhan O'Brien Green, is going to give us some um, updates on behalf of, of, the, of uh, the Hospice Foundation. Um, and thanks a million for doing that, Siobhan. Yeah. So you're thanks. so good. You have about thanks. 10 minutes. Yeah, thanks so much. And um, thanks as well, uh, Georgina and Francis, for the earlier setting sets. It's been really informative, really helpful, and really centering, actually. The session so far and thanks to you Georgina for your expert organization and guidance today. I'm just going to try and share my screen hopefully this works and hopefully you guys can hear me okay too. So yeah we can hear you. Um, so here we go. Um, so just a little update. Um, so to, to start off with uh, I just wanted to fill people in and some of the work we've been doing really uh, over the last couple of months in the Irish Hospice Foundation and a sneak peek preview of our new logo as well that's on this slide. You'll be seeing more of that soon. We haven't drifted too far from our original sunflower, but I think it has the integrity of the strength of the, of, of the strong stalk and the reaching upwards as well still too. But one of the things that has been really exciting that's happened over the last two months and we've gone live in public is our new bereavement support line in collaboration with our colleagues in the health service executive. So you've probably heard updates on this before the Kill Connect or through uh, email updates that the Kill team have been sending out to you. But just to fill you in a little bit more, um, we've been thinking about this in the Irish Hospice Foundation for a period of time, but it seemed now more than ever that this kind of um, support through a phone line accessible to people, free phone, national around the country was, was really uh, needed. And we're able to get the technological support to make this happen with our HSE colleagues. So it's a 1-800 number, a free phone number. It's open every day, Monday to Friday, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. We have a series of um, trained uh, staff. We have some volunteers from our master's program as well that's come through the IHF and RCSI master's program answering the calls. And we do have a callback function. So it's got a messaging service. So if someone calls at a certain time and asks someone or requests them to call them back at a certain point in time, that can happen as well. You've probably seen some of the flyers or information we've sent out about it. This is just one of them I've picked uh, for the 1-800 number. We um, started it with a kind of a, a sort of soft launch and, and that colleagues such as you know and our colleagues in the acute hospitals know about it to make sure everything is working okay. And then we went public with some radio advertisements and other information in early June. So we're almost coming up to a month of the line being open. I can tell you at this point, we've had almost 200 calls from all over the country from different age groups as well too. So just to say who can call, it is an adult helpline, so it's for people over 18. And it's by people who've been impacted by in any way, shape or form by bereavement, including during the recent months, including through COVID-19 or through any cause of, of death and grief and bereavement. It can also be used as a support line for people if you're concerned about somebody, a friend, a colleague, a neighbor, um, another family member as well too, to contact. Um, also, we're finding on causes that people who've had bereavements perhaps a year ago, perhaps two years ago, because of the focus in the media at the moment. And as Francis said, the figures we're so familiar with every single day, previous uh, brief, grief, bereavement and loss can be feeling more challenging and, and people are struggling with it more. So again, it's something to reach out. It's a um, not a counseling service per se, but if issues emerge during the call, we do have referral procedures and processes where we can uh, direct people to local services that they might be needed and also facilitate that as required as well too. But really it's a listening and support service. Now for yourselves, it might be the case that um, for colleagues or staff or members of your team who've been uh, bereaved or the loss and the grief and the bereavement that's happened in the workplace as well too, you need some support or information around that's absolutely open to call the, the helpline as well too. So we'll probably have a little bit more of an update in about a week in terms of kind of uh, data and figures a little bit from the um, anonymized, of course, from the callers that have uh, used the service um, coming up soon and we can share that with another one. But we just want to really flag it that it is for the public, for anyone to contact and to utilize. And so far, we have been taken up on this offer by members of the public, like I said, from, from different regions, different counties, different age groups, and for different circumstances as well, calling around grief and bereavement, uh, and, and in particular as well, people who've been recently um, uh, through trauma and grief for COVID-19. 
So just, a, and I'm happy to answer any questions as best I can about this. The other big piece of work has been our care and inform resources. And I know you've been sent out uh, some of the uh, resource links and the links to our website hub as well too. So we've had a huge response in terms of our website visits and traffic to it. And obviously it's all about things from a distance, being able to access things remotely, being able to access things virtually as well too. So visits to our website are practically double when we look at the numbers last year. And in particular, a lot of the visits are going to our COVID-19 Care and Inform hub, which, which you've probably heard is different areas on it for um, health and social care professionals, for the public or those who are caring for others around advanced care planning. And we have a new section about the helpline. So the image you're seeing now is just a flyer we've devised that um, we do have print copies. Um, we, the way we designed it, we were particularly thinking of our colleagues in healthcare settings, in primary care settings, in nursing home settings, in hospital settings, where it's easy and colourful to pin up and put up on your notice boards. It has the information about the bereavement support line um, and also the care and inform resources, a, a snapshot and a summary of those two. So we have PDFs of that if you want to just print it out on your own. Uh, copiers or printers at work, but we also have hard copies and um, feel free to contact any of the Kill team or Susan if you're looking for copies to be sent out to you. We have done some dissemination with um, the GP journal uh, form and also with nursing in general practice and we're very open to getting it out through other routes or suggestions you might have as well to the flyer just to point people to the care and inform hub. The other uh, uh, work we've been doing it and, and Joanne, our, our colleague in the IHF and the Kill and HFH teams, we've been working really hard in this, is our end of life care resources. This includes a family handover bag, which is the green bag with the um, purple end of life spiral on it, um, for the uh, dignified, um, appropriate return of a, a person's belongings to their family or loved ones after their death. And then our new uh, resource, which is you can see it in, is a small purple velvet drawstring pouch that came out of our HFH quality improvement awards from an idea of a colleague of ours, Mary Moroni, in Port Yonkla Hospital for keeping smaller things such as um, jewellery or a watch or rosary beads or small items so that they don't get lost or mislaid or so that there's a significance and the importance of them is retained again once you're safely and, and um, respectfully returning uh, items uh, from someone who's deceased to their family or loved ones. So we've been working with our colleagues in the HSE uh, on working hard ourselves. I'm going to be doing a uh, dissemination of these resources to all our kill contacts and colleagues over the next week or so. Um, what you're seeing in the middle of the slide is just a, a kind of how-to information a flyer or information sheet about the resources that will be going out with the deliveries. So we'll be sending out five of the small pouches and five of the bags to you all um, with a copy of the flyer I just showed you for care and inform and with it in, uh, the information reordering and how to use sheet as well, you can see on the slide. So expect those coming soon. They'll obviously be a bit staggered, some might get sooner um, rather than later, but I hope by the end of the next week, most of you should have received these. And again, if you've got questions or queries about that, we're very happy to answer or respond to them, contact any, any of us in, in, in the KILL team in the IHF. And the final thing, I, I, hopefully, Georgina, do I have enough time to fly through some of the survey monkey? Um, um, a couple of minutes, yeah. Yeah, so just, uh, just uh, I wanted to say a big thank you because um, uh, through our Kill Connect sessions and our emails, uh, we sent out a short survey to yourselves uh, around really working through the last couple of months and what it's been like. And I just wanted it, it's unethical to gather research and data without feeding it back to the respondents. So I want to give you a real whistle stop tour of some of the issues that came up and really this is a quote that I feel sums it up as well too and actually harks back to what you were saying Francis about the challenges we've been trying to work through over the last couple of months and the situations we find ourselves that it's not really as we'd wish a lot of the time because of the pressures the challenges and the infection control we're working through at the moment. So the challenges really that were mentioned um, from the, uh, the, the respondents are about uh, staffing less uh, levels, visiting restrictions, staff stref stress and anxiety, and constantly changing updates and guidance. Um, some other uh, respondents mentioned not being able to do the kill reviews they'd like, the challenges around infection control and supporting families. So the stress and anxiety piece, I think that really relates to what Mary has talked us through and walked us through today around self-care. Um, the next, uh, uh, the question was we asked what would be most helpful. 
supporting families and the updates and guidelines and policies to send them out. So I'm hoping that the care and inform resources, particularly the caring for others, the what to expect when a loved one is dying in a nursing home, the frequently asked questions around palliative care, a lot of those and as well, the uh, bereavement support helpline could be useful resources you could share with families of, uh, of people or residents that have uh, died recently. The updates and guidelines and policies, we do circulate as often as we can, but without over overwhelming you um, through our killed connect sessions and also through our killed newsletters. For our support settings sessions, uh, you asked us for uh, information on resources and guidelines and also the self care and staff well being piece, which is one of the things we've done today with Mary. On the other areas, you asked for at our kill networks was a specialist part of care and staff well-being which is exactly what we put onto the agenda today as well so that is the end of uh, and that's a really whistle top uh um uh sorry i'll just make sure I don't know if i'm still sharing now hang on um whistle stop tour of our um of our kill survey and am i still sharing my screen sorry yeah I you're still sharing oh sorry i've just uh I'm having a little technolo technological issue now here. Um, can, you, can you share her screen, Susan, or does she have to do that herself? There we go. There we go. Perfect. So just, just to wrap up, um, the final thing I wanted to mention uh, to all of you is that uh, we made a submission and we were invited to present to the Nursing Home Excerpt Group, which is, as you know, was uh, set up by our now previous Minister for Health. Uh, Simon Harris in response to uh, nursing homes and um, the COVID-19 situation and I, we were myself and Sharon fully presented to the group and one of our key things is really enhancing and supporting end-of-life care in the setting is, and also the kill survey was very helpful to inform our presentation to make sure we were really relaying the issues and concerns that you and your colleagues have in the sector and the challenges you've been working through as well so I want to just relay my appreciation and thanks for the respondents to our survey because that helps us and informs us do our work and to meet your needs as best we can and as i that also gave us a platform to leverage what uh we we heard and our the feedback you gave us into really the highest levels in the department of health as well too and where the needs are greatest so thank you very much Siobhan, thanks a, a million. Does anybody have any quick questions for Siobhan on any of that? And um, we will, we have been sending out our resources and our bereavement um, line uh, information so we can continue to, to do that. But if, yeah. if uh, no, anybody, any questions? No? No? Okay. Um, so just before we sign off, um, I just wanted to do a couple of things. First of all, the, the NMBI uh, awarded our current set up for virtual uh, online networks, 1.5 CEUs. So if anybody wants that, we can organize a search for you. If you want to email us in um, and, we'll, and we'll definitely organize that for you, no problem. Um, I don't know, Kate, did you want to say anything? I'm just going to sign off and thank everybody very much. I want to thank all my, my colleagues for being here, Siobhan and, and Kate and Mark and, and Mary and Susan and Joanne and all of you oh. for joining in. Just, just in relation to certain centres, you know, if there's more than one or two people actually listening, we would need to know that in relation to giving certs and stuff. Because um, oh, at, the, at the moment it would just be kind of an, in, in one person coming up. But I do know, Jaya and Moat, you mentioned there's a few of you there. So just make sure you let us know so we get the, we get the correct number and the cert, and certs out to people. Oh, and very again, good thank, point. Yeah, no worries. You keep going, Georgina, you're doing great. No, sorry, did you want to finish off? I brutally no, interrupted you there. No, that's it, that's sorry. it. Um, thank you, everybody, so much for joining in. We have thoroughly enjoyed today. Francis, you are an absolute star. Thanks a million. That was a really good presentation. Mary, we're all taking something out of your wonderful presentation from today and, and, and taking it into our hearts and our beings. We're going to be not just do from now on, Mary. <laughs> and um, thanks for that. And we will continue to run these events more than likely once a month. Um, again, with a specialist palliative care input and, and uh, another relevant presentation as well. Um, and so thank you very much. Other than that, I'm going to sign off unless anybody's any.